Good morning to our participants and welcome to the eighth session of the Environmental Law Online Training Program. This training program is developed by the Legal Education Board in partnership with the Asian Development Bank and the IUCN Academy of Environmental Law, as well as the UN Environmental Program. I am Attorney Maria Romina Gumal, Program Coordinator of the Legal Education Board, and I will be your host for today. The topic for today's session is panel discussion on climate change law. Before we get started, for a brief recap of our last session, we discussed the topic on the role of courts in addressing environmental protection in the Philippines with our resource speakers, Professor Galahad P. Benito and Brioni Elis. Our resource speakers discussed the roles of court in addressing environmental protection issues, which includes discussion on the rules of procedure for environmental cases, the basic concepts of risk, rate of kalikasan, mandamus, and the cases involving climate change. Now, to begin our session, I'd like to go over to our house rules. Please, please let us know if we could record this session today. We will only start recording if all parties consent to the recording. Mute your microphone while waiting for others to join in and when not speaking during the session. Use the chat option if you have questions or comments and click the reaction option to interact with our speakers and guests. Turn off your video camera after taking of the picture to lessen the, the amount of bandwidth. for everyone in the meeting. The links to the registration form as well as the evaluation form will be sent in the chat box. Kindly check, check our chat box and fill out the registration form to confirm your attendance. The evaluation form will also be sent in, in your email and you may fill it out after today's session as part of your attendance. We will also be having a reflective journal to record our participants' learning experience in this training program. The links to the reflective journal will be sent in the mailer announcement, so kindly access the link and fill out the journal. Lastly, we would like to remind everyone to join us in our Facebook page, Envi Law Asia, to see the latest updates on environmental law activities, the trainings, and engage, and to engage with fellow environmental law advocates. All right, let us now begin the session with the introduction of our invited resource speaker. Our resource speaker is a commissioner in the Climate Change Commission. She is an alternate board member in the Green Climate Fund, the largest global finance mechanism for climate change pro projects, and in the Philippines Survival Fund, the country's adoption finance mechanism. Previously, she advised the Senate of the Philippines Committee on Climate Change, Finance, Foreign Affairs, and Environment, and worked for the passage of a number of landmark climate and environmental laws and international treaties, such as the country's accession, accession to the Paris Agreement. She earlier received, served as a clerk of court to the Supreme Court Associate Justice and in the International Committee of the Red Cross. She obtained her degree in law from the University of the Philippines and environmental science from Ateneo de Manila. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Commissioner Rachel Ann Herrera. Good morning, Commissioner. Hi, good morning. Uh, thank you so much for that kind introduction. Good morning po to all of us, uh, environmental law professors, deans, uh, faculty members, law students, uh, Commissioner Sorera T, to Attorney Rose Lisa Esma Osorio, Thomas Clark, Dr. Georgina Lloyd, and of course, fellow speakers, uh, Dean Antonio Lavinia and Undersecretary Annalisa of the Department of Environment and Natural Resources. Magandang umaga po sa inyong lahat. It is our honor on behalf of the Climate Change Commission to join you this morning for this online training program for environmental law teachers. So thank you so much for extending the invitation to the CCC. And I would like as well to thank the organizers for putting together this program, which we think is very timely and urgent considering uh, the backdrop of, of the COP, the UN climate change negotiations that just concluded in Glasgow and shown earlier in the AVP. This morning, I'm uh, asked to discuss the Philippines nationally determined contribution or our national decarbonization targets. But please allow me first to give some context. 
by touching on global and national frameworks on climate change. And I'm referring to the Paris Agreement on Climate Change, our Philippine Development Plan as updated, the climate change law, and other relevant laws and policies. So just to backtrack a little, in August of this year, 2021, a report was issued by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or IPCC, and this is the biggest scientific body of experts on climate science, composed of thousands of scientists from all over the world, 195 member countries, and there are, of course, several Filipinos there on the list. And their report in August is uh, sixth in a series uh, spanning uh, maybe a decade now or so. And essentially the report is saying, we are in code red. That those are the words of the United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres. So what does the report say? Uh, say? It says uh, in so many words that humans have caused global temperature increase of around 1.07 degrees Celsius compared to the beginning of the industrial revolution. And this has been uh, the cause of phenomena in uh, changes in precipitation patterns, our rainfall, uh, ocean salinity, the warming of the oceans, melting of the glaciers, sea level rise, and acidification of the oceans as well. And the, there is an unprecedented scale of these changes across the climate system compared to centuries of the planet's existence. And this human-induced climate change is already affecting many weather and climate extremes in all regions of the world. And this is causing heat waves, heavy rainfall, droughts, and tropical cyclones. So extremes uh, in whatever region you may be located in. And perhaps you may have heard or come across the term 1.5 degrees. That is the call of developing countries and it refers to a provision in the Paris Agreement, which is the landmark treaty adopted in 2015. And the main goal of the Paris Agreement is to limit global average temperature rise to well below two degrees Celsius or pursue efforts to limit it to 1.5 degrees. So it refers to the temperature rise compared to the world's temperature on average during the 1850s or so. So just on this 1.5, this is uh, where all the world's efforts are coming together to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees. And it was the Philippines uh, in 2015 that fought together with developing countries to, to have this in the treaty. And this 1.5 represents our survival threshold because scientists are in agreement that beyond 1.5 will be catastrophic for all countries of the world and most especially the vulnerable countries like the Philippines because of our geographical location. So limiting global warming to 1.5 is the goal and what would this entail? It means we should all get our acts together to implement rapid, large scale and immediate reductions in greenhouse gas emissions. And this effort must come especially from the industrialized nations, the developed nations, the richer nations, because they have historically contributed most of the accumulated greenhouse gas or GHG emissions now in the atmosphere. And uh, historically we're referring to the United States, the countries of the European Union, Japan, and now uh, joining the ranks of those uh, that are the highest emitters are some developing countries like China, which is currently at number one, and India, among others. So to focus on the 1.5 again, uh, I cannot uh, overemphasize this, that anything beyond 1.5, even a degree, the difference between 1.5 and 2, will significantly worsen the risks for all of us in terms of all sectors, agriculture, fisheries, health, water supply, human security. And of course, this has implications on how we can further expand our economy. So given 
that the IPCC has said that we are now at around 1.1 degrees. And if you remember Yolanda in 2013, we were just at one degree warming then. How would this look in terms of transitions that we will need to undertake across our economy, economy-wide uh, transitions in other terms. So now that it's clear that 1.5 is the climate pathway, we are looking for the pathway to bring us to that, to 1.5 degrees by 2030, or that should at least be uh, representing, scientists say, 45% decrease in carbon emissions by 2030. And net zero, net zero carbon emissions by mid-century. So the Paris Agreement method is requiring all countries to submit a nationally determined contribution or NDC. And this is the cornerstone actually of the agreement by which the temperature rise can be limited. So NDCs are country targets determined by every country according to their own situations and context. And starting 2020, countries have submitted this as their contribution to achieving the Paris Agreement goal. But there has been some analysis from 2020 over the last two or three years. And in fact, since 2015, uh, countries have been submitted, submitting intended NDCs, and we were one of them. But just from the data coming from 2020, the United Nations has also estimated that it will bring us to attract, uh, it will bring the world to warming of 2.7 degrees Celsius, 2.7 degrees. That's way beyond the 1.5 degrees goal. So that was the main goal of the UN climate negotiations in Glasgow, how to enhance uh, what we call ambition in the NDC targets. And um, the COP in Glasgow was just concluded three days ago, Sunday. And there's a lot of literature and reactions from governments, from civil society on that. If you would like to know, our Philippine delegation in Glasgow was led by the Department of Finance uh, because the DOF is the chairperson of the Climate Change Commission in, in the person of Secretary Carlos Dominguez. And they, uh, they uh, represented the country and urged fellow parties to the UN Climate Convention, uh, the historical emitters, to provide uh, what we have been asking for also to help us achieve our NDCs. And these are mainly through three forms, means of implementation through finance, uh, technology, green technologies, and capacity building. So more or less, you have the elements of the Paris Agreement. You have the goal of the 1.5. You have the pathway, which is the 1.5 degrees Celsius. And to implement it is through those three means. So for the Philippines, we have submitted our NDC in April of this year, and we committed to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions for this decade, 2020 to 2030, compared to our business as usual, or if we would do nothing at all. And the rate that we are going to reduce is at 75%. And this will come from the sectors we have identified, agriculture, waste, transport, industry, and energy. Those are the five key sectors by which we are going to commit a reduction. Of course, these are also the highest emitting sectors in our economy. And this target uh, in real figures uh, represents 3,340 metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalent for this 10-year period, or now it's just nine years. No? So while our greenhouse gas emissions are comparatively smaller than the global average, what is really our uh, share? It's less than 1%. It's three-tenths, one-third of 1% of the global total. Uh, we are not taking the position that we will not be 
doing any reduction or avoidance at all. So our NDC is considering the likelihood that our emissions would significantly increase because of our growing population and our continued um, pursuit of economic development. And more importantly, we see the NDC as an investment plan. It's a roadmap. It's telling investors, this is where we want to go. This is how we want to shift our economy towards low carbon technologies, sustainable transport. We're now seeing BRT, electric vehicles, POV modernization, and so on. So our NDC target is what you would call ambitious. And in climate jargon, it means a target that shows enough commitment to further reducing emissions and ensuring or helping the world achieve its targets of net zero by 2050. But you might want to, uh, you might want to know how we are going to achieve these targets, where we would get the funding. Of course, out of the 75% target, some of that are already committed or programmed in our public sector budget. That's 2.2%. Uh, unconditional commitment. Uh, also, uh, climate jargon, unconditional versus 72% conditional commitment, which we mean we will undertake if we are able to receive the means of implementation of finance, technology, and capacity from the developed countries. So that commitment actually from the developed countries is part of their obligation under the Paris Agreement. So uh, again, uh, we think of examples of the 2%, which is committed by the country, uh, bus rapid transport, uh, the national greening program of the DNR, and so many others. So the NDC puts a priority in the reduction of carbon footprint in the agriculture sector and in the undertaking of nature-based solutions, rehabilitating our ecosystems, and increasing our renewable energy capacity by 15,000 megawatts by 2030. This is according to the DOE's Philippine Energy Plan. Across the pact, the global pact, countries are supposed to submit NDCs every five years, showing a progression from what was initially committed in 2020 all the way to 2025. So every five years, Countries will meet and present, what have you done? How, uh, how well are you able to uh, deliver compared to your target of five years ago? So the future submissions of the Philippines will also, I suppose, aim to increase our unconditional targets so that we eat up more of the 75% by um, more specific, more detailed, programs that have uh, evidence-based targets. Because for now we're saying the 72% is there. We have a list of technologies and policies that we think are good or applicable or appropriate for the Philippines if there is sufficient external support. The NDC is our vehicle to transforming our sectors and society towards being more sustainable and Climate resilient, it is aimed to make our sectors, let's say our transport, our buildings, our, our cities, to become climate proof so that the risks of climate change, such as sea level rise or stronger typhoons, are taken into account. And addressing climate change is very clear in our updated Philippine Development Plan in ensuring ecological integrity, clean and healthy environment, ensuring food security and resiliency to reduce malnutrition and vulnerabilities of Filipino communities. And of course, the overall theme of the Philippine Development Plan is to build safe, resilient, and healthy communities. We have many other laws that provide support to the NDC targets and the PDP. And just to enumerate a few, is uh, the Ecological Solid Waste Management Act on segregating waste and ensuring we are reducing waste at source, the Clean Air Act, 
the Renewable Energy Act, which should now be already in full blast uh, of implementation with all the incentives uh, that was envisioned in the law. Of course, the Climate Change Act has to have a special mention. It's the law that created the Climate Change Commission and also its amending law, our mandatory law of the People's Survival Fund Act, which created the PSF as a national adaptation grant for LGUs to, uh, to fund their programs for adaptation, uh, meaning programs that will help them prepare for the impacts of climate change, according again to their local climate change action plan and their risk assessments at the local level. There's the Energy Efficiency and Conservation Act, which complements the RE law, because aside from reducing uh, emissions through the kind of energy that we use, if we could also be wise in saving energy in, on the demand side of energy, that would also have a major impact in reducing our carbon footprint. Another flagship campaign of the CCC and the cluster of agencies uh, that have a mandate on uh, related to climate action is the campaign to phase out single-use plastics and promote sustainable consumption. So this is also mentioned in our NDC, approaching a circular economy. And this is because there is a, uh, there's more and more studies showing that the world is weaning, uh, trying to wean away from fossil fuel and coal, but the coal industry is also putting investments in the plastics industry because I guess not many of us knew this before, but 99% of plastics are made from petrochemicals, from petroleum. So all the way from the drilling of the oil to transport to production of plastics, this is very much intertwined with the oil sector. So the more plastics we use, it's not just a waste management problem, it's also a public health problem and a climate change problem. So we are saying that single use plastics, especially ones that we have always thought to be disposables, uh, used just a few seconds for packaging and then easily thrown away. These are actually just 9% of them are recycled. Uh, the 91% end up somehow in the landfill or uh, in the natural environment on the beaches and floating in, in some ocean. So that is a huge problem that is linked to climate change that we would also want to emphasize this morning. The CCC has also crafted the National Climate Change Action Plan. And this has guided the work of the whole of government approach on climate action. Uh, the National Climate Change Action Plan has uh, defined key thematic areas as well, where we see a lot of vulnerability. These sectors will be or are being highly impacted by climate impacts, climate change uh, risks. And to enumerate, these are on food, water, ecological stability, human security, including health, climate smart industries, sustainable energy, and knowledge and capacity development. So just on the national laws and frameworks, I think we have enough. We have a strong foundation of environmental laws that support the NDC targets. And the challenge really is how to make sure that they are implemented. You know, this is uh, something we have always uh, known, but we will be able to make significant progress if we are uh, committed enough to ensure that the NDC implementation, the roadmap that is being developed right now uh, through a whole of government approach as well will be really implemented. So ambitious climate action will also require ambitious financing. This is a major issue for us because it, uh, it relates to our call for climate justice. Climate justice being that our targets for the NDC should be supported by those countries that caused this problem in the first place. 
So it's, it's a core principle in the UN Climate Change uh, Convention and which remains as well a, a core uh, point of discussion in every annual COP. So this is a tough balancing act. How far should we uh, go in terms of uh, aiming our targets for carbon reductions? And how, uh, how much should we ask from the international community? And in fact, the international community or the developed countries have a commitment to bring in $100 billion annually to the developed, developing countries rather, beginning 2020, all the way to the next five years. So this is $500 billion by 2025. And their commitment as well is to increase the figure after 2025. But unfortunately, in Glasgow, there was just a, a recognition of or an expression of deep regret, no? in quotation marks. There's a deep regret that countries noted that this $100 billion has not been delivered. And looking at the main operational mechanism of the Paris Agreement, there is a fund called the Green Climate Fund. It only has $10 billion to date of funding for all developing countries. So uh, financing uh, the, the primary agency that has uh, the mandate to oversee this is the Department of Finance. And they have said that they are pushing for a three-point blended approach, blended finance, wherein they will orchestrate this uh, climate financing from the uh, international community and in three forms. First, grants. Second, investments. And third, subsidies. So this will hopefully make climate finance uh, more uh, workable for us in terms of supporting concrete plants down to the local level to deal with climate change because we know the local government units are the frontliners in terms of disasters. They're the first ones who should know, who should issue the early warning, who undertake evacuation and then recovery, rehabilitation and so on. And it happens at an average of 20 typhoons a year for the Philippines. And then apart from disasters, we are supposed to fund green energy transition and provide subsidies to the private sector, for instance, for a greener economy. So the situation now is that climate impacts are worsening. Rainfall is becoming more severe. You can also feel in the city that it's really hotter. It's really hotter. And the last 10 years on record have, uh, have been the hottest decade on record. So that's uh, based on data. And so we must accelerate our action, our climate action to safeguard the most vulnerable. Uh, it's the populations that are on the brink of, or just at, at the border, no? uh, tinatawag natin, they can be easily pushed back into poverty with just one disaster. They're one disaster away from poverty. So the goal of the government, together with all sectors, is to improve the quality of life of every Filipino. And this is really a challenge with the current pandemic and the climate crisis, which uh, threatens us in the next years and decades, all the way to mid-century and end of the century. Our NDC, our national decarbonization target, as well as our national strategies, hopefully are setting us on track towards this goal and to be a helpful partner of the international community. And it will be up to us, each of us, and in the sectors that we belong to ensure that we reach this goal. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning again. Thank you very much, Commissioner Herrera, for that very substantial lecture on climate change, the Paris Agreement, and um, the Philippines' nationally determined contribution. So we now move on to the second resource speaker to discuss the topic on the NDC and the IPCC report. Our next resource speaker is a leader, a teacher, a thinker, a human rights and environmental and climate 
justice lawyer. And he is also a social entrepreneur. He's the Associate Director for Policy and International Relations of Manila Conservatory, which he had led as Executive Director from 2016 to 2018 and 2020 to 2021. He has been teaching philosophy, constitutional and political law subject, environmental law and policy, negotiations and conflict management and leadership subject in several universities and learning institutions in the Philippines, including the Minde in Mindanao and several seminaries. He is formerly the Dean of the Ateneo School of Government, an Undersecretary of the Department of Environment and Natural Resources, a Senior Fellow and a Program Director at the World Resources Institute in Washington, DC, and a founder of the Legal Rights and Natural Resources Center, known as LRC and Ashoka Philippines. He obtained his LLM and JSD degrees from Yale University and his first degrees in philosophy and law from Ateneo de Manila University and the University of the Philippines respectively. He placed third in the 1989 bar examination. Ladies and gentlemen, let us all welcome Dr. Antonio Gabriela Vigna. Dean. Hello, thank you. Thank you, Maria, for that introduction. Thank you, uh, Com uh, Commissioner Jojo and uh, the lab uh, for inviting me to, to talk uh, before you um, today. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a pleasure. Um, if it's climate change, I, I always say yes. And especially if it's lab, I always say yes, uh, being also a uh, uh, Quite active in legal education and in the legal uh, in the legal profession, including the Philippine uh, Judicial Academy, where um, I chair the uh, jurisprudence and legal philosophy uh, department. Uh, so I, I I do have an interest as an environmental and climate practitioner um, in getting uh, environmental law into the mainstream of of legal education. Ah, look off, but that's strange. My, so a minute, sorry. It says here live. That's it, sorry. It says my video is on. Sorry. Uh, something's wrong with my, you know, my, um, because it's I- It's okay, po, Dean. Um, let me start it down. Uh, kanina pa siya nakastart. Kayo ata nag-off, ano? I think. Kasi okay, kanina. I'll ask our tech team. Uh, anyway. Uh, yeah, for some, because in my, you know, I'm able to turn it on, but for some reason, it's, wow. Yeah, what is that? Yeah, we, uh, can, see now, we, can, we can see it now, Dean. We can see it now, Dean Tony. We can see you now, Dean Tony. The one yes, moving. Uh, no. anyway, okay, so yeah, sorry. Um, okay, but anyway, so, 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 you have the PowerPoint. Anyway. Uh, Uh, sir, yeah. we can see your slide already. Okay. And problem, I can't see it. Naman. <laughs> I don't know why. Uh, anyway, but, but, but I memorized it in my slides. But ano, um, no, my, my, uh, as, a, as a law professor, as a practitioner, um, uh, especially in climate change, I've done this work for 30 years, really, from the very beginning of the, of the convention. Um, and uh, as uh, chair of the jurisprudence and philosophy department of uh, of Jeddah. The goal really is to mainstream environmental law into the uh, profession and into our legal educational system. I mean, um, I think we're nearly there with uh, with required electives now. I, I actually get to teach this in almost ten law schools uh, now. No? and of course, the sir is uh, needs to be uh, you know, needs to be um, climate change because climate change is the kind of the biggest uh, challenge that we have. My my talk is on legal uh, on on the national determined contribution. I entitled it. Uh, 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 issues and and prospects. No? Uh, I won't repeat what we have said in our NDC because we have that in, uh, in our Herrera's uh, uh, presentation. But what I'd like to do is to give you a history of 
how we ended up even with the term and obligation. That is really the obligation of countries under the Paris Agreement. Uh, next slide, please. Um, uh, parang may lag ata kasi I don't see that. We should go to the next slide, which is the 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 slide on oh, no no no. I I don't see it in my screen anyway. Dean Tony, we're currently under history and nat uh, in nature of nationally determined contribution. Sir. Hey. I think Dean Tony is having an internet connection problem. So we, we can we might have lost him. So we would we would like to request everyone. So we will just wait for Dean Tony to come back. Maybe we can give in at least five minutes and then we'll be proceed with the lecture. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, sir, loud and clear. Okay, so um, anyway, this, that that's the outline, you know, the outline um, uh, of 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 my my talk. No, I mean, uh, I actually want to start first in understanding because my my talk is about the legal aspects, um, and later on I'll talk about uh, AR six at the end in the context of Glasgow, um, but. Um, uh, I think it's very important for us to understand what NDC is in international and national law. This being a legal audience, this being uh, audience of law professors that have to teach this, this subject. I mean, and we need to connect it to concepts we already know, we understand already, um, like a concept of an obligation under international uh, law, the difference between soft law and and, and, and hard law. No? Then I'll go, go to some critique of the NDC from a legal um, uh, and policy point uh, of view. I've been asked to make sure to talk about Segovia versus Climate Change Commission. So I'll, I'll, I'll do that. Um, also as a critique and suggest a way forward for litigation, for, for climate justice uh, litigation. Um, I'll, well, before that, I'll actually talk also forestry and indigenous peoples because that's a big gap in the, in the NDC. And like, like, uh, like Commissioner Herrera, I'll, I'll link my talk to Glasgow what it means to the Philippine NDC, what it means to climate litigation in the Philippines. Next, please. Next slide. Um, so you need to understand the context of what, and, and NDC, that's the first time, first agreement that, uh, no, no, that, uh, that the use, the term NDC is used. So where did this come from? No? Well, first of all, it comes with a whole debate for the last 30 years on common but differentiated responsibilities. In the early years, this was clear. About developed countries polluted first and have more resources. Therefore, they have more responsibility. But because climate change is a global responsibility, everyone contributes to climate change. Everyone is affected by climate change. Every country, every party must do something about climate change. But responsibilities are differentiated. So walang problema yon yung concept. Then up to now, it's real. The problem is over the last 15 to 20 years, the dynamics of economies have changed. China is no longer a developing country. China is the number one emitter, and China is uh, economically as wealthy as the United States. I mean, um, China's conquered poverty, in my view, no? uh, while India, for example, has not conquered poverty. We know that. But China, based on Millennium Deve Development Goals achievement alone um, in 2015, have more or less conquered 
uh, ano, so but China is still the number one advocate of CBDR. So strange, di ba? Strange. And all of us are affected. Philippines, of course, we can invoke a CBDR, but not as much as 150 other countries. That's why, uh, and I, Commissioner Herrera knows this, I actually disagree with this analysis that we're small, we don't emit, etc. Yes, in relation to 40 countries or 30, 35 countries, because we're in the 35 to 40 rank. But with the rest of the world, we are a high emitter. High emitter with respect to Fiji, high emitter with respect to Samoa, high emitter with respect to all the Caribbean countries. So if you actually say that hindi tayo kailangan mag-participate, everyone after us hindi kailangan mag-participate, the problem will not be solved because there's still 30% of emissions that's going to be left. So anyway, but that's the context. No? The other context is the failure of the Kyoto Protocol. Yung Kyoto Protocol kasi, uh, I use the, the, or the, the conventional concept of commitments, which are targets, diba? Uh, you know, in my first 10 years as a negotiator and as a climate advocate, the goal was just to get developed countries to reduce their emissions. Wag nga muna developing countries. Developed countries lang. Wala na, 5%, 10%, 20%. We wanted, in fact, in Kyoto, I was the chief negotiator in the Philippines, uh, ang call namin doon, 20%. Uh, uh, reduction uh, by, by 2010. In 1992, when we were negotiating the convention, our call was actually stabilization by developed countries uh, uh, by, by, by 2000, both of which failed, which means na hindi mag work yung ipapasa mo to every country and every country will be asked to give a commitment because of the political nature of, of this problem. Diba? Uh, and how to divide. While the concept of a carbon budget, global carbon budget, makes sense intellectually, the moment you start dividing it, how many will reduce what, it's, it becomes problematic. It becomes problematic because what's the basis? Historical emissions, per capita emissions, development needs. Iba iba, exactly common but differentiated. Even the circumstances are differentiated. So palpak yung Kyoto Protocol. Uh, especially because the U.S. did not, did not join. <clears throat> in the meantime, things overtook us by the 2000s. And I saw really this happening, uh, yung, yung how uh, climate change became real events. In my first 10 years as an academic of climate change, climate change was a foreseen event. By the 2000s, climate change became a real event. In our case, Reming, Milenio, Frank, and finally Ondoy. Uh, and of course, Yolanda in 2013. But even in the first 10 years, you already have this sense that climate change was with us already. And therefore, adaptation became very important for us. And mitigation by all countries now become important because even if the developed countries mitigated substantially, it will still not solve the problem. Uh, if developing countries didn't do their part, the big ones and the medium ones, no? The, the less developed countries, the AOCs, uh, uh, sila talaga yung may moral basis for saying that we don't even have to mitigate. But because they're also the number one victims, they're actually very good in, in mitigation as well. And then, of course, there's the mitigation adaptation balance. No? In the first 15 years of the convention, focus lang talaga sa mitigation ng developed countries. After that, we insisted, developing countries insisted, people, especially in our case, people like... Uh, 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 Bernadita Smuller, uh, the late Bernadita Smuller, uh, vice use, the star actually from Glasgow, although not negotiating for the Philippines uh, uh, already, uh, they were very strong in adaptation. Fred uh, Serena, Serrano of uh, the, the, the Department of Agriculture, they were the stars uh, in the 2000s in the negotiations in the Philippines, uh, the Philippines pushing the It's the one that then led us to national determined contribution. Because of this failure of the Kyoto Protocol, the sense that common but differentiated responsibilities was so diffused now, hindi na siya yung north-south lang, but there are countries in developing countries that actually need to also have more responsibilities than us, uh, and us also have more responsibilities than other developing countries, uh, although we are equally vulnerable to them naging ang framing ngayon, hindi na per group, 
hindi na per develop or developing country, per country na. Kaya yun ang ibig sabihin ng national determined contribution. Each country decide by itself what they should do based on their circumstances, but based also on an overall target. That's not legal for every country, but legal for the world, which is strange. It's a strange concept. In Warsaw in 2013, uh, at, at the, right after Yolanda, Hayan, that decision was made. It was a relief, to be honest, as a negotiator. Kasi before that, ang feeling ko, parang hindi ata magkaka-agree sa agreement sa Paris. Balik na naman tayo sa Copenhagen. But after that, hindi na kasi issue yung, di ba, we are not, we're not going to be telling each other anymore what to reduce. We're now gonna tell ourselves what we can reduce, how we can reduce, what we need from the world to reduce our emissions and to adapt. Always for, remember that NDC includes adaptation and needs to have a financial goal in the NDC and needs to have a percentage in the NDC. And I will talk about that later on from a legal point of view. Next slide, please. So the Paris Agreement, when you analyze that from an international per perspective, is a pa an agreement that is a commitment to a process. It's not a commitment to targets. Although there's an overall target of 2 or 1.5, I think it's moved nearer to 1.5 now, uh, that target is really not legal because the responsibility is collective. Right? It's, it's the world's responsibility. It's everyone's responsibility to, to reach that. Everyone must contribute to that overall target, which I hope we can, now, we can interpret now as 1.5. I, I currently now interpret that after Glasgow as 1.5. Um, but the, otherwise, the commitment is really just to process. Uh, every country commits to a process to arriving at a uh, arriving at a um, arriving at a at a, 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 a target a, a, a commitment called the NDC that they then submit. The submission itself is political, uh, in the sense that uh, you know there, there's no legal uh, compliance procedure. There's a facilitation procedure that can be followed if you don't meet your NDC. There's a shaming procedure. There's a reporting procedure you have to follow how you implement it, but it's political in, in, the, in the sense that it, there, there are no sanctions if you don't do it or if you change it, etc. To make it legal in your country, you must have existing legal uh, policies and measures, including uh, uh, laws that must be laws that must be uh, be passed, no? Uh, uh, laws that must be, be, be passed or already passed, as, as, as Commissioner Rachel said. The role of the judiciary then is to be able to, we can go to the judiciary to have those laws, measures, and policies implemented. But I don't think you can do it for the NDC itself because that is a, a political commitment. Next, please. Uh, let me go now and apply this analysis to very good NDC. Excellent premises, although I think there needs to be an inventory uh, because a 2010 data is not really that, that good. Uh, I think uh, Commissioner Rachel pointed out the target is fine, 75% is fine, it's very ambitious, uh, but I do think that the ratio between conditional and conditional needs improvement. Um, needs to be, this needs to be mainstream in, in the budget. There, there are actually studies already done, like the CPEIR done by the World Bank, a while ago. We actually need to review our laws. I'm not sure that all our laws support the, the, the implementation of the NDC. So I think we would have to have to do that. Next, please. Um, uh, I think the elephant in the room is energy. Uh, I think the government in Glasgow and even before Glasgow have, have taken and made announcement of, of good steps for, for, for renewable energy and also for stopping new coal. To be honest, for me, uh, we lost 10 years under the Aquino administration in the first four years of the, the Duterte administration, uh, uh, essentially because we bought on a law that we had passed, the Renewable Energy Act, and, and uh, did not implement it effectively and promptly and faster. We, we lost 10 years and we don't really have the time anymore. I welcome the announcement that we will also retire 
our some of our existing coal power plants. I think we have to retire all of them as long as we can climate finance uh, the replacements and the uh, compensation if ever there needs to be compensation for it. Next, please. Um, uh, I think a big gap in the NDC, I've said this again and again, I've asked every forest expert I know, uh, and they say that it's wrong, it's not, it's it's inexplicable that the NDC does not include protection in hunters forest. Very big opportunities for climate finance there, including, including for communities and, and potential in forest activities for core benefits like livelihoods, but inexplicably, uh, the government did not include that. We can change that because we have to revise our NDC in the next year. Next. Uh, so go versus climate change commission. Actually, it's not a, there's no substance in that case. It's really just about, about procedural, procedural, right? And I agree with it, no? It's the issues about cars, pollution, road sharing, very good, very good uh, uh, framework. Um, but it's not, uh, writ of Kalikasan is not appropriate because there is no specific law that is really referenced there. And I mean, um, and here I must say for the environmental lawyers and teachers here, uh, and, and this is controversial, but I'm reading something from the court, no? Um, including our biggest allies there, like Justice Leonan, for example. Move on the tayo po from Aposa and resident mamas. Good precedent, but that, uh, that is, di ba? I want to say passe, but that's, uh, that's, that's historical na lang. Pangkwento na lang yan, di ba? Uh, kasi settled na yung mga issues na yan, procedural yung mga issues na yan, di ba? Um, although sa resident mamas, nandun yung right of nature issue na pwede pa natin siya i-develop further, no? Kasi uh, they don't address it, ano? The better precedent for us, Manila versus the a beautiful case. It's the best case, better than Oposa, better than Manila Bay, uh, the, the, the MMDA case, better than resident man, miles. Kasi substantive and makes a difference, di ba? Uh, yung iba kasi, puro panalo ka, pero hindi ka naman talaga panalo. Oposa did not lead to saving our forest, di ba? Resident miles, maganda yun kasi panalo siya against oil, oil drilling, no? Um, Manila Bay, hanggang ngayon, hindi pa siya napapanalo sa totoo lang, in real life, di ba? But Manila versus DNR is the public trust uh, doctrine. Ang ganda siya. It really has the potential of changing a lot of things, including in climate change, di ba? Everyone that's given some use of our atmosphere, our air, has a public trust to take care of it for us. So it's so rich in possibility for litigation. Next. Uh, patapos na po. Uh, this is the last slide. Glasgow. Uh, my column today in, 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 Manila, in Manila Standard is about that. I'm disappointed, obviously. Uh, you know, it's a good, okay naman siya, but minimum siya. Hindi siya maximum possible that could be agreed on. Minimum possible. Parang barely enough lang para, di ba, makalabas kayo dun. At least may buhay pang proseso. May pwede pa tayong gawin. May konting advances naman. So bakit tayo masyado malungkot, di ba? But certainly not defeated, no? Alam mo sa akin, I'm not con uh, concerned about the main thing, many environmental activists who really do not know the law so much, di ba? Yung face out versus face down, that's nothing. Kasi face down is also face out. It's a, it's a stage to facing out, di ba? And the truth is that you face out coal when you deal with the finance of coal, di ba? And almost all finance institutions now are saying they will no longer finance coal. So panalo na yung coal. The better win is the phase out of fossil fuel subsidies. Kasama natural gas, kasama oil, no? Uh, disappointed of, of course, the climate finance because we could have advanced that as well. And the developer just to, um, uh, but, but at least we can push it next year. In you can push it five years, 10 years. Uh, you know, the Philippines was crucial in the creation of the climate uh, green climate fund, especially Bernadette's Muller, almost single-handedly for 15 years. Yan. Partner ko si Bernadita sa, sa negotiations. For the first years, halos walang kasama si Bernaditas, even in developing countries. Kasi everyone was okay, sige na lang, World Bank na lang, GEF na lang. Si Bernadita talaga nag insist di ba? Hindi, we have to have our own financial mechanism, half-half at least, or controlled natin. Control, hindi naman siya control natin, but it's 50-50. So we have the GCF as a result uh, of that. There's lots of things we can do with the GCF. Now, I just came from a four-year term in the accreditation panel in the GCF and daming possibilities, but I don't think we have maximized. Uh, I think we should give you know $100 million proposals to GCF, not $10 million proposals. No? That means we have to get our act together to get that done. No? Loss and damage was also for me a... Uh, uh, a disappointment 
But may advance din naman sa Santiago Network, which is the, we'll flesh it out. And here, let's praise Vice U, the, the developing country negotiator. Unfortunately, not our negotiator, but negotiator natin as developing country. He negotiated under Republic of Guinea. Vice is just asked by any delegation, uh, like DITAS was, the developing country to, to negotiate for us. Because they're the best negotiators. They're the best Filipino negotiators. No? They know this stuff in and out. There was a good agreement on the sustainable development um, mechanism. Uh, yan, that can help us with the NDC, but you have to be careful with safeguards. The good thing is that we got to go back next year, not five years from now, not 10 years from now. Pero tayo, we have to go back with a new NDC. Uh, maybe not the target is okay kasi mataas ng 75%, but with a clearer, more precise uh, NDC in terms of climate finance, clearer projects to to do for energy, I would include forestry in that new, new NDC. Absolutely no reason for, for excluding forestry. I would go and um, include adaptation. That's the other thing I cannot understand. NDC's adaptation is part of our NDC, but we did not put it as the part of that 75. Oh, we did not quantify it. Important for climate finance to do that. And it requires a little bit of environmental economics that has to be done. No? So, Yon, I want to end there. Lots of uh, implications, uh, uh, but we, we do have something to work on, both legally in our own legal procedures, as well as under international law. Thank you, Paul. Thank you very much, Dean Lavinia, for that very significant and detailed lecture on NDC and for sharing your insights on the case of Segovia versus Climate Change Commission. So we will now be having our five-minute break. So we, we advise everyone to be back at um, 10 3 So you can you can make, you may take your personal break and then we will just continue our lecture after five minutes. All right, so I guess everyone is back in the room. To continue our discussion on climate change law, our, re our next resource speaker will talk about the DNR contribution to the NDC and climate change. Our resource speaker is currently the DNR Undersecretary for Finance, Information Systems, and Climate Change. She finished her Bachelor of Laws in the University of Philippines and became a member of the bar in 1998. She was recognized as one of UP College of Law alumni for public service. After law school, she joined the DNR as attorney three, her government service as a lawyer, including serving as executive director for the Adjudication Board of the Department of Agrarian Reform, or DARAB, and the director for legal services of the Housing and Urban Development Coordinating Council, or HUDCC. She also served as DNR Assistant Secretary for Legal Services from 2005 to 2011 and as DNR Undersecretary and Chief of Staff from 2011 to 2016. Ladies and gentlemen, let us all welcome Undersecretary Annalisa Revuelta Te. Thank good morning, so Undersecretary. Yeah, good morning. Thank you so much, uh, Ma Maria, for the very generous introduction. Uh, let me uh, acknowledge uh, my colleague and friend, uh, Commissioner Rachel Herrera, of course, our mentor, Dean Tony Lavinia, uh, Commissioner Joe Sorera T, also a schoolmate and classmate uh, of the Law Education Board, Attorney Rose uh, Osorio, Chair of the IUCN Academy of Environmental Law, Mr. Thomas Clark from ATP, Dr. Georgina Lloyd of uh, UNEP, uh, uh, Attorney Oposa of, uh, of the Normandy Chair for Peace, Attorney Galahad, uh, Pe Benito, environmental law professor and advocate, and Attorney Donna Gusconia, another environmental law professor and advocate. And to all uh, participants here from various universities, I even saw our assistant regional director, Attorney Clay, you know, from DNR CAR. So good morning, everyone. My task today is to share with you the DNR's commitment to the NTC and the National Climate Change Action Plan. And um, the outline of my presentation would be to uh, share with you the, on the, the first part of the EN, on ENR sector mitigation measures, and then the second part, uh, the ENR sector adaptation measures, and then the ENR sector contribution to the National Climate Change Action Plan, which was uh, earlier introduced by Commissioner Rachel Herrera. So on the first part, on the ENR sector mitigation measures, um, 
As mentioned earlier, the Philippines communicated its first NDC on April 15, 2021 to the UNFCCC and the Philippine con uh, Philippines uh, NDC conveys the country's progressive climate change mitigation commitment and adaptation challenges and requirements, including addressing the residual loss and damage in pursuit of low carbon, sustainable, and climate and disaster resilient development. And the Philippines uh, commits to a uh, projected GHG emission reduction and avoidance of 75%. Uh, 2.71 is uh, unconditional, unconditional and 72.9% is conditional for the period 2020 to 2030 for the sectors of agriculture, waste, industry, transport, and energy. And this mitigation commitment is referenced against a projected business as usual uh, cumulative economy-wide emission of 3,340 metric ton uh, carbon dioxide equivalent for uh, same period. So for the, in our sectors, three sectors will contribute to the NDC, which are the waste sector and below that are the su subsector on solid waste and wastewater. And then the other sector would be the industrial processes and products use sector. Okay. So let me start with the contribution to the NDC by the waste sector. Uh, let's look at the GHG, GHG emission from this sector. The waste sector emitted 13,800 gigagram carbon dioxide equivalent for the year 2010, based on the 2010 GHG inventory report uh, developed by the DNR Environmental Management Bureau. And the um, emissions from the wastewater subsector contribute to about 66% while the share of solid waste is 34%. And the emissions from this sector come mostly from uh, the domestic uh, wastewater, 63%, and from solid waste disposal, 29%. So um, in the NDC, we identify the policies and measures not to be able to uh, reduce the emissions from this uh, sector. So for the solid waste subsector, these are the policies and measures that we have identified. Uh, one on composting, then methane flaring in sanitary landfill, methane recovery, digestion of organic solid waste, use of eco-efficient soil, uh, soil eco efficient soil cover, and uh, uh, sanitary landfill reduction measures. So we will go over this uh, quickly uh, one by one. So first on the composting of organic Waste. The target is by 2030, composting rate will increase by 24.3% with three new large composting facilities to accommodate 1,000 ton per day of biodegradable waste. And um, this is expected to uh, generate 12.52 million tons carbon dioxide uh, mitigated. Uh, in the NDC, we also identify the barriers, and one of the barriers identified with respect to this specific PAM or policy and measure is the need to assess the different uh, or the the need to or, or the lack of um, market sustainable market for compost products such as food waste, compost, vermicast, soil con conditioner, which could be attributed to the limited awareness regarding the characteristics of compost, variable compost quality, and absence of local regulations and ordinance requiring composting of orga organic waste. There's also a need to assess the different composting technologies such as on-site uh, on composting, the vermicomposting, the window composting, aerated, uh, and other uh, technology and their applications so that we can really uh, pursue or achieve the target regard expected from the composting of organic waste. The second pass, uh, PAM is with respect to the methane flaring of, uh, the methane is a form of hydrocarbon that is a primary component of uh, natural gas and it is a greenhouse gas. And um, we need to uh, uh, reduce the methane by uh, a kind of technology uh, which is methane flaring in disposal uh, facilities. And this amounts to about $200 million. And if we will be able to adopt this, it is expected that by 2030, 30% of methane from the 86 sanitary landfills 
with capacity under 24 under category 4 which means that it can accommodate residual waste of more than 200 metric tons per day will uh, be recovered for uh, flaring and um, cumulative mitigation potential for this is estimated to be 3.23 million tons for carbon dioxide but uh, the limitation is that Flaring of methane is currently not provided under Republic Act 9003 or the Solid Waste Management Act. It only specifies gas control recovery system is needed, but not specifying the flaring of methane gas. Uh, methane gas. Uh, another barrier that uh, we can uh, that we have cited in our NDC is the need for uh, further research and study for. Uh, policy recommendations and demonstration and pilot implementation of the flaring technologies. Another PAM is on uh, still on methane recovery from sanitary landfills for electricity. We are targeting that by 2030, 56% of sanitary landfill uh, under category four capacity uh, will be able to adopt methane recovery technology and that would mean 10.75 million tons of carbon dioxide uh, mitigation potential but again the we need to overcome the barrier regarding application of landfill gas to energy technology in the country so um, landfill gas helps to reduce odors and also uh, if you capture it and convert it it can be used as a renewable energy resource now, so we hope that uh, we are targeting under the uh, NDC that we're, we will be able to have a, this kind of technology. And then also the waste of energy uh, in the form of recovery through anaerobic digestion. Uh, we hope to have this in the, our uh, third, uh, municipal solid waste. Uh, right now, uh, we are targeting about 31 WTE facilities twist in until 2025 to accommodate 1,000 ton per day by the correctable waste. And this is equivalent to um, 2.43 million tons carbon dioxide equivalent. So the barrier that we need to overcome is the application of this digestion technology. Uh, we still have to expand. And of course, um, we still have to ensure the proper segregation of uh, waste, which is uh, provided under RA9003. But uh, as you know, there is very uh, there is uh, difficulty in implementing this and enforcing by the local government units. And then another policy measure is the use of eco-efficient soil cover. The entire landfill surface is covered with a gas distribution layer of gravel and overlain with a homogeneous layer of bioactive coarse materials or the eco-efficient soil cover and gas passes passively through the bio cover layer where it is oxidized. So um, the application of eco-efficient soil cover is intended to be an option for soil cover requirement during closure of small uh, disposal facilities. And um, with the eco-efficient soil cover, compost is added and soil cover is loose, which is different from the existing standard, which need the, needs soil cover to be compacted. So this may result to soil erosion in areas exposed to frequent and extreme rainfall. So we have to uh, adopt this kind of technologies, which are already uh, being used mostly in European uh, countries. Still under the sector, waste sector is the wastewater subsector. Uh, we need the mitigations from the wastewater subsector are geared towards shifting from septic system, which is partly an aerobic system, uh, pro which produces methane to a centralized aerobic uh, systems where there is negligible emission. And the three categories on the policies and measures identified are expansion of sewerage and septage treatment facilities, compliance to the mandamus for the Man Manila Bay rehabilitation, and the utilization of biogas capture and production technology in select industries. So on expansion of septage and sewage uh, treatment facilities, we are targeting that by 2020 to 80% of the population in the 17 um, priority highly urbanized cities will have access to newly 
uh, constructed centralized aerobic treatment facilities, and then 20% of population from 21 cities outside Manila Bay will have access to centralized aerobic treatment facility. And if you are able to do this, we will be able to have a mitigation potential of 17 million tons of carbon dioxide uh, uh, equivalent. But uh, that the barriers that we have to address in order to attain this target is the technical capacity of the local government units and the local water districts, and the need to invest on the uh, construction of more uh, sewerage treatment facilities. Uh, as we know, under the Clean Water Act, it's required that within or uh, within five years, you no, know, the the water concessionaire should be able to provide the the full connection, but uh, uh, under the, uh, it was not able, uh, it was not achieved. And in the recent Supreme Court decision, they were provided until 2037 to, to fully comply with this uh, requirement. And then uh, in the Manila Bay, why Manila Bay? Um, there are four, three provinces and uh, of course the, the full NCR, uh, is key to uh, addressing uh, clean water and also uh, this is where we can be able to fully um, hopefully fully at, uh, uh, meet the, the construction of the sewage treatment facility to to meet the, the needed um, uh, mitigation potential of about 7.99 million tons carbon dioxide equivalent um, so we need to address the lack of space within Metro Manila to put up these wastewater trans, uh, treatment facilities. And to be able to do that, we have to address the presence of informal settlers in the steros and creeks in Metro Manila and the surrounding provinces in the Manila Bay area. On industrial wastewater, uh, major industrial wastewater sources with high methane gas production are uh, seen in pulp and paper manufacture, meat and poultry processing, sugar refining, alcohol, beer and starch production, organic chemicals production, and other food and drink processing. So uh, we would like to um, uh, promote industrial wastewater systems and technologies that would capture and utilize biogas in an uh, anaerobic system. And this has a mitigation potential of 0.9 million tons carbon dioxide. And to be able to achieve this, we need to address the lack of awareness of the industries, private sector on the use of this kind of uh, technologies with um, methane recovery and the need to invest resources and also technical knowledge you know, to operate these technologies. On the IPPU sector, this is the complete picture of the IPPU sector. So we have there the cement production, the, the mineral industry, and um, it is in the, IP, the IPPU sector covers the greenhouse gas emissions occur, occurring from industrial processes that chemically or physically transform materials such as cement where limestone is heated or calcined to produce the quick lime, uh, quick lime or clinker and carbon dioxide is emitted from the process. And this includes the mineral, chemical and metal manufacturing industries in addition, uh, IPPU sector covers the use of greenhouse gases all in producing also uh, refrigerators and air conditioners. So we look at the GHG inventory from the IPPU sector uh, emissions, and it was shown that the IPPU sector in 2020 accounts for 10,379 gigagrams or 1,000 tons carbon dioxide equivalent, and the bulk of the emissions, about 73%, is attributed to process emissions from cement production, followed by emissions from uh, HFCs or hydrofluorocarbons in the refrigeration and air conditioning industry, about 16%, and process emissions from iron and steel production, about 11%. So these are the identified uh, uh, policies and measures. Uh, one on clinker substitution in cement, increased use of caliat in uh, glass, use of glo uh, global warming, uh, potential refrigerants by the refrigeration and the air conditioning sector, establishment of destruction facility for ozone depleting substances and hydrofluorocarbons and 
uh, other short-lived climate pollutants uh, measures. So the, for the first PAM on clinker substitution, um, uh, the as uh, as mentioned earlier, the clinker is a um, nodular material produced in the kilning stage, and uh, we need to sub, uh, substitute this with uh, supplementary cementitious uh, materials such as fly ash, granulated blast furnace slag, and natural uh, pozzolan-like limestone. No? Because, or, or we call this the blended cement, which has a significant lower clinker content of 70% than the ordinary Portland cement, which is uh, 95%. And if we are able to uh, address this, we will have uh, mitigation potential of 20.65 million tons carbon dioxide uh, equivalent. The barriers is uh, with respect to the standards. Um, we have a, uh, a standard which uh, requires only, um, um, I mean, the, 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 the DPWH is following a standard which requires a lower blended cement and as uh, differentiated from the PNS uh, standard or the Philippine national standard. So right now they are still uh, working on the, on, uh, on this uh, standard that we have to adopt no, to ensure that we adopt more of uh, blended cement rather than the standard cement. And of course, um, we need to also to address the limited availability of clinker substitutes, such uh, which I uh, already mentioned earlier. And then the second uh, PAM is on increasing the use of cagat in glass production because glass is 100% recyclable and can be recycled endlessly without loss in quality or uh, purity. And glass is made from readily available domestic uh, materials such as sand, so the ash, lime, limestone, and call it no, the industry term for furnace ready recycled glass. So if we are able to increase caveat ratio of float and flat glass to 40% by 2020 and increase the ratio for container glass to 75%, we'll be able to uh, have a 0.59 million tons of carbon dioxide equivalent of mitigation potential. And uh, so therefore we need to address the need to increase the recovery of disposed glass, particularly for flat glass. The third is the shift to low glo global warming potential refrigerants. Um, uh, it is estimated that the global phase down of HFCs will reduce global temperature rise by up to one half degree centigrade by 2100. And um, we need to support local manufacturers in converting a low global warming potential based split type and window type air conditioning production and easing the import of low carbon, low GWP based split uh, air condition to accelerate the market uptake. uptake. And uh, mainly window and split type uh, air conditions with small capacities are uh, used in the Philippines, which allows for an efficient and uh, safe use of low, uh, low global warming potential um, refrigerants. This estimated that 19.9 uh, metric million tons carbon dioxide equivalent could be, avoid, uh, could be avoided from facing in low uh, GWP refrigerants in 2020 to 2030 from the various uh, refrigeration and air conditioning uh, sub-applications uh, including mobile and large vehicle air conditioning, chillers, domestic refrigeration, uh, condensing unit and standalone and centralized refrigeration. The fourth one is the destruction facility for ODS and HFC. So right now we have a destruction facility for persistent organic pollutants, but we need one for ODS and HFCs. Um, so we hope that 70% of the HFCs and ODS will be recovered and destroyed in a, uh, or disposed, uh, uh, will be recovered from disposed uh, RAC equipment and to be destroyed in the uh, dedicated destruction facility. Uh, this has a mitigation potential of 10.53 million tons and uh, we need to address the needed resources to construct this facility uh, to achieve this target. 
Okay. So those are the mitigation measures that we have committed under our national uh, determined contributions, particularly from the DNR or the ENR sector. For the adaptation measures, we have committed uh, sectors from agriculture, forestry, energy, coastal, and marine ecosystem, and biodiversity because there's a need to sustain adaptation planning and resilience building while noting the mitigation benefits of these various measures. So for the forestry sector, uh, earlier, uh, Dean Tony raised that um, forestry was not included in the mitigation, but rather in the adaptation measures. So meaning uh, if it's not included in the mitigation, we are not uh, inclu uh, including it as one of the conditional uh, areas no, for the mitigation measures. Uh, we thought, well, basically an advice of the uh, tech panel of technical experts, uh, the forestry sector is not is currently uh, a net sink. Therefore, it does not yet emit any greenhouse gases and does not have uh, greenhouse gases uh, mitigation potential. So we we need to decouple it from the other core sectors of the NDCs, you know, like agriculture, waste, industry, transport, and energy sectors. Um, I think there is also a, this strategy was also uh, uh, adopted because when you include this in the mitigation sector, uh, it will be a funded because it is a conditional uh, um, measure, it will be funded and there is a, a threat that by uh, being able to have access on our forestry data, the data also with respect to biodiversity will be attained. And uh, because our own biodiversity uh, inventory is not yet that fully developed, we might be able to uh, uh, volunteer information that we and therefore they will have more chance to develop our biodiversity resources because we have committed them under the uh, conditional. So I think, um, it's not just it's not that we do not want to share our resources, but we, we just would like to make sure that we will also share in the ben benefits uh, in terms of the income stream. And therefore, uh, we it's not just we are after in the capacity building, but we also would like first to develop our capacity uh, on our own, our capacity to measure the value of this biodiversity resources and their uh, uses before we can offer the forestry sector um, as a conditional measure. So the succeeding slides will just, I uh, will just run through the policy measures based on the gaps and challenges that we have identified. No? Uh, for example, on the, the need to develop the capacity of our implementers and decision makers on the impacts of climate change on forests and watersheds, uh, the watershed degradation and risk of natural disasters. So we are committing under our adaptation measures, the capacity building on watershed management planning, forest uh, protection, forest restoration, watershed rehabilitation, urban uh, forestry, and to address uh, and also red the red plus reducing emissions from deforestation and uh, degradation, um, agroforestry development, um, forest plantation development, fuel wood bioenergy plantation development. For ecosystems research, we would like to uh, address uh, uh, the gaps regarding uh, also impacts of climate change on income and livelihood, carbon sequestration, increasing uh, urban temperature and our adverse impact on communities and the uh, carrying capacity of selected islands for ecotourism. So the policy measures include adaptation strategies towards resiliency, counting and mapping of our ecosystem carbon stocks and soil carbon emotion, uh, emissions, development of mangrove vetum for biodiversity conservation towards ecotourism, improving green parks and recreational areas and uh, improving the carrying capacity of ecotourism sites. And then on protected areas to address the challenges on climate change, habitat loss, uh, over exploitation, invasive alien species and pollution, we commit to uh, as one of the policies and measures, the protected area development and uh, management. And then in, with respect to our coastal and marine ecosystem, we are implementing the 
Coastal and Marine Ecosystems Management Program, and we are committing that as one of our adaptation measures. And then for industrial and economic zones, uh, particularly on issues on water quality management, air pollution, flood control and heat management, we are we propose the implementation of greening of industrial and uh, economic zones, which uh, entails adoption of environment and climate friendly uh, technologies, uh, such as energy efficient and non pollutive technologies, 100% water recycling, uh, waste heat recovery, also establishment of uh, green spaces or tree parks, uh, and also green uh, transition. And then for contracted uh, wetlands, uh, because these are natural wastewater treatment systems, no, and uh, we would like to use this as nature-based solution and cost-effective alternate to improve treated uh, wastewater quality standards. So those are with respect to uh, NDC. Um, the next part, which uh, uh, asked uh, us to present to you the contributions of the ENR sector on the National Climate Change Action Plan. So um, the National Climate Change Action Plan basically outlines the country's agenda for uh, adaptation and mitigation from 2011 to 2028. And the ultimate goal provided there is to build the adaptive capacity of women and men in their communities, increase the resilience of vulnerable sectors and the natural ecosystems to climate change and optimize opportunities towards uh, gender responsive and right-based sustainable development. Uh, earlier, uh, Commissioner Rachel uh, presented the uh, seven strategic prior priorities, no? and I'll, I'll focus on ecosystem and environmental stability. Uh, all this uh, strategic priorities has a cross-cutting um, uh, components on gender mainstreaming, uh, research and development, technology transfer, climate finance, and uh, monitoring and evaluation. Um, so for the ENR-related strategy, uh, strategic priorities, the ultimate outcomes involves uh, enhanced adaptive capacity of the communities, resilience of natural ecosystems, and the sustainability of the built environment to climate change. And the main uh, priority, strategic priorities on ecological and environmental stability and on another outcome regarding successful transition towards climate smart development, strategic priorities include uh, climate smart industries and services, sustainable energy and knowledge and capacity development. So for strategic actions on ecological and environmental stability for 2011 and to 2028, we will focus on the development of climate change mitigation adaptation strategies for key ecosystems, improvement of management and conservation of protected areas and key biodiversity areas, enforcement of our environmental laws, and enhancement of capacities for integrated ecosystem-based management approach in protected areas and key biodiversity areas and institutionalization of natural resources accounting. So we have 10 major programs in the DNR uh, that we intend to, that we are implementing to achieve this uh, main uh, components or uh, of the or goals or outcomes of the National Climate Change Action Plan. As you can see from the diagram, uh, it is a ridge to reef approach. We have the, to address the reforestation, we have the enhanced national greening program and the intensified forest protection and anti-illegal lagging and to enhance biodiversity conservation, which will cover both terrestrial and uh, coastal. Uh, to address uh, pollution, we have the clean air, solid waste management, clean water, and also improve land management and um, scaling up of coastal and marine ecosystems and the Manila Bay cleanup and the geohazard groundwater assessment and responsible mining. So it covers all the sectors there, forest, agroecosystem, the urban, the coastal and the marine ecosystem. On the climate smart industries and services, although it involves uh, other uh, in the uh, other departments, uh, this involves, uh, as mentioned, the uh, the climate smart industries, and in addition to that, uh, creation of sustainable livelihood and jobs from these uh, climate smart industries and development and promotion and sus uh, sustainability of green cities and municipalities. Um, as emphasized earlier, or uh, 
uh, I think in one of the speeches of the Secretary of Finance that uh, the Philippines, which is one of the most climate vulnerable countries, contributes only 0.33% of the world's uh, total greenhouse gas emissions. So why are we committing with a, an ambitious uh, commitment of 75%? No? And all, uh, Din Tony Lavinia emphasized earlier that even though we are a small country in terms of emission, we also have to do our role and uh, also commit in the mitigation. And also we need, uh, as part of the climate justice, we need the, to tap or access the means of implementation through capacity building, technology transfer, and climate finance, which uh, the developed countries are under obligation to provide to developing countries. And we also need to facilitate our transition to a low carbon development path, achieve a climate resilient society and promote sustainable climate investments in the country. So by committing an ambitious NDC, it is also an opportunity for us to really um, have uh, or move towards a green recovery and sustainable uh, future. Uh, the developed countries are com committed actually $100 billion uh, dollars, uh, up to 2022 or 2020, yeah, 2022. But I think uh, based on the COP agreements, they are extending this to 2025. In the case of the Philippines, we need about $4.12 billion uh, from 2015 to 2030 for our climate change mitigation uh, programs. Now, and this does not include the cost for the Philippines to reach each, uh, its national uh, determined contributions or goal of 75%. Uh, this is um, last part. I would like to um, just to emphasize that as individuals, what can we do? And um, in in the midst of the pandemic, we need to reimagine our relationship with nature. We need both significant government policies and important personal uh, behavior changes uh, for us to really uh, pursue uh, transformational change. Uh, times of change uh, can lead to the introduction of lasting habits. And during the start of the coronavirus outbreak, those habits that are coincidentally good for the climate, such as traveling less or perhaps cutting down on food waste as we experience then uh, shortages due to stockpiling and reducing non-essential consumption. But the uh, COVID-19 uh, in the short term has radically altered our lifestyle. But for climate action, we need long-term cultural and behavioral shift, but then again, substantially um, changing behavior uh, requires us a as a general rule, structural changes to the choice ar architecture in which uh, individual consumers make decisions, such as regulations uh, to ban certain products or activities or large price hikes. Now, I, I saw in the chat group earlier, the proposal to increase taxes for polluting industries or new infrastructures. Uh, in a separate report entitled 1.5 degree lifestyles, targets and options for reducing lifestyle carbon footprints, the current consumption patterns were examined and the potential reduction impacts of low carbon uh, lifestyle options were evaluated. And perhaps we can go over this and see how, what we can do to contribute to the greenhouse gas uh, emission reduction. So for carbon footprints that uh, have the potential of 500 kilograms to over 1,500 kilograms per option per year, we can go car-free private uh, travel, uh, promote renewable grid electricity, electric cars, vegetarian diets, uh, which I still trying to achieve, <laughs> renewable off-grid energy, hybrid cars, and vehicle fuel efficiency improvement. For 250 kilograms to 500 kilograms per option, we can do ride sharing, uh, living closer to workplace. Now this uh, quarantine, um, that we are doing uh, work from home. Uh, we are actually contributing uh, to the greenhouse gas uh, reduction. Use of heat pumps, smaller living spaces, car free commuting, alternative dairy products, and low carbon footprints are good uh, measures. Uh, for those less than 250 kilograms per option per year, efficiency improvement of home appliance, telework reduction of food loss efficiency, improvement of food production, saving of hot water and reduction of light. So um, 
as individuals, we can adopt this as part of pursuing or promoting cultural and behavior, behavioral change, changing our lifestyle. During the press state of the nation address report of the cabinet cluster on climate change adaptation, mitigation, and disaster risk reduction, DNR Secretary Roy uh, Simatu highlighted that the climate emergency remains urgent as ever. And it is like the COVID-19 emergency, just in slow motion and much graver. And in the ministerial meeting of the Coalition of Finance Ministers for Climate Action, uh, Department of Finance Secretary Carlos Dominguez said that unlike COVID-19, for which a vaccine will likely be produced soon, there is no uh, climate uh, uh, quick solution for the climate crisis. So we need to act now with the same sense of urgency that we have for the ongoing pandemic. So as we deal with the response to the pandemic and the recovery path, we can actually transform these challenges. We need to ask ourselves, how do we find opportunities in all this crisis? This crisis that we are all unfortunately confronting provides us the opportunity to rethink, reevaluate our directions, our choices for the economy, for the environment, and for the humanity. So how do we do it? We need to see clear signs that the pandemic and our societal response to it will lead to significant and permanent changes in the path of future global emissions. And we need to analyze our responses to pandemic through a climate lens. And we can, in fact, convert this crisis into opportunities to accelerate climate action. So the basically, the barriers Thank that- Thank you we very- uh, early uh, Sorry. Um and Madam Secretary, I, I think we'll have to wrap up there uh, to allow some time for panel discussions. But thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, I just have two remaining slides. So as we discussed the barriers earlier, you can see that the systemic that the problems are systemic, and therefore the solutions are also systemic. So the, we need to promote transformational change to restore the balance between natural systems and human systems by adopting long-lasting, sustainable, inclusive, resilient, low-carbon, low-polluting, nature-positive, and circular economy-based pathway for our society. And the government is uh, uh, asking the support of the private sector and the communities and other stakeholders so that we can all together uh, achieve this uh, direction. Maraming salamat po. Thank you very much, Shusekte, for that very substantive lecture. So we will now move on to the panel discussion. So to our participants, if you have any questions, you may raise the you may click the raise hand button in the reaction function located on the right side of your screen. You may also send your questions in the chat box and we'll just read it for you. So we have with us Matthew, who will be our moderator for today. Matthew, the virtual floor is yours. Thank you very much indeed. And thank you very much for all of the excellent presentations. Um, I have included in the, uh, the chat box a, a short um, paper that was done just on a comparative analysis um, of national determination, determined contributions for ASEAN. Um, and I think it's also important as, as Attorney and Lisa mentioned that um, a lot of this uh, reduction was based on um, uh, support from um, outside the Philippines through financial measures, conditional, um, essentially, responses. And I think this is also one of the, the challenges that we have is that as the, the global north or the richer countries have, have failed essentially to, to come up with uh, funding opportunities or financing opportunities um, to really respond to the, the continuing uh, need for uh, adaptation and mitigation uh, in developing countries, we see what what is called sort of this climate injustice, this finance gap. Um, and I think that's quite uh, a, a challenge going forward. Um, we do have some really interesting questions um, in the, uh, the chat box. So maybe uh, I can ask some of our um, uh, attendees. Um, Attorney Guantero, did you want to um, make your comment and ask your question about um, uh, solar rooftop PV? Or Professor Galahad, if you'd like to unmute yourself and ask your question and make your comment. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Matthew. Yeah, uh, I, I made a comment in the chat box regarding a survey I conducted among my students. And uh, it appears that uh, most of them would prefer a strong government intervention. So they're uh, thinking about uh, taxes 
and less uh, influenced by these polluting companies in uh, the formulation of policies regarding climate change. Um, and I think that was also supported by Attorney Meningas. Um, so I, you know, Commissioner Herrera, um, Madam Under Secretary, I mean, in terms of that idea of a strong uh, government, I, I think a lot of um, this interest about climate change is we see a lot of, of, of reaction, but is it is it strong enough? I mean, should we be more prescriptive in these things or do we need to, to still continue to work um, jointly with, with industry? Thank you. Uh, if I could go ahead uh, Please, first Commissioner. before Under Secretary Te. I, I am so happy with that uh, observation without comment uh, based on the survey of students. So it means more are in favor of really a strong regulatory approach. In fact, there have been uh, some progress in that. We have increased our coal excise tax in the last uh, two years, I think, based on uh, legislation. The coal excise tax has been increased to 50 pesos, 150 and 100 and 150 over a three year period per metric ton. Uh, seems small, uh, sounds small, but it's, it's, uh, it gives a, a signal in the right direction. And of course we have the Department of Environment declaration of moratorium of new coal. So that is also a, a very strong uh, regulatory policy by the DOE. Uh, we have heard the DOE secretary say that our priority right now is energy security, but they are trying obviously to balance uh, interests of not having the rotating brownouts that we have uh, in the 1990s, uh, trying to serve uh, our very big population. And what is very, uh, what is strategic right now is the move of the DOE to uh, serve the off-grid uh, small islands with renewable energy and they've started in Palawan. There has to be uh, really strong support in that. And I would like to mention one proposal that we helped facilitate in the Green Climate Fund, which is uh, the Climate Investor One. It's for the private sector facility of the GCF to support the Philippine RE developers with off-grid energy. And this is already known to the DOE and we hope they can uh, serve first the, the unelectrified areas of the country. So uh, uh, the talk about taxation is also uh, growing uh, stronger in the international community. That is one highlight in the COP, the talk about carbon markets. Of course, it has to start with the developed countries first. They should there should really be a price on carbon. There is no argument about that, but as to which uh, regulatory uh, framework will be followed, how do we compute uh, carbon in and out, where it is emitted or who owns the carbon income, these are all still uh, being debated. But yes, uh, we're seeing again, as a final note, also strong, um, a strong decision by the Banco Central ng Pilipinas to issue a sustainable finance framework. So this will be uh, this will be mandatory by next year for financial institutions to to um, declare their uh, risk appetite for uh, investments that do not pose environmental risks or high high risk uh, against environmental, social, and uh, gender and governance safeguards. So just to mention uh, these progress uh, across many fronts. Thank you. And, and just on that question of um, uh, solar rooftop, there's a question from uh, Attorney Guantero about um, low hanging fruits in GHG emission reduction is the installation of solar rooftop PV in all of the 1700 LGU capital buildings and the city municipal hall. Um, will the CCC support a proposal for the establishment of a financing facility for solar rooftop PV for local government units? That's a big question, I think, isn't it? Well, in terms of just asking the CCC if we would support, of course, absolutely, we would support 
more uh, renewable energy across the country. And it's also because we have a very high potential of RE. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of sun, there's wind and, and ocean uh, that's being uh, developed. And we, we are have always been number one or number two in geothermal, and we're also strong in hydropower. So, so developing uh, more solar will be beneficial if we could transition all our lighting for buildings, because buildings actually uh, comprise, um, I, I forget the statistic, but in cities, they are a high contributor in terms of emissions. So if we could retrofit, we could allow uh, more efficient energy in all our buildings and LGUs can show the way. If there will be probably a, a national program led by DOE, we would definitely support that. We'd like to see that. Thank you, Commissioner. So, uh, and the Secretary. Um. Yeah, uh, just to add to what um, Rachel uh, uh, mentioned, we are also promoting now, there's a pending bill regarding extended producers' responsibility where we require the companies you know, to be, uh, 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 be responsible for the, the waste that come from their uh, products. But uh, aside from, of course, regulating them, I, I think it's also important that we balance uh, it with incentives, like we encourage them to uh, shift their packaging into uh, more uh, sustainable packaging, and also for them to shift to new technologies that are um, more um, environment friendly. So it's really promoting a circular uh, economy, and uh, that would require not just uh, uh, increasing taxes, but also providing them, them incentives because there would be a key role in uh, promoting uh, a circular economy. Yes, and, and look, I, 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 of course, as you can probably tell from my accent, I'm an Australian environmental lawyer, so I'm very well aware talking about coal and the Australian government has essentially recommitted to doubling coal exports um, over the next 10 years, which um, goes in the face of any uh, any you know, policy incentive to, to reduce coal um, and other fossil fuels, which is always a challenge um, on the basis of, uh, they say that they are achieving their, their commitments, um, you know, subject to a, a range of, of interesting accounting measures. Um, but it does seem that, you know, um, interestingly, the, the states uh, and territories in Australia um, have all committed to sort of 100% renewable targets um, and a lot of that is being driven, you know, very much at the, the local government level and, and the state level. Um, I see uh, Attorney Tony has, uh, Dean Tony has come back. And there is also a question um, from Attorney Libiran about um, that uh, the Global Environment Facility determined a few years ago that 85% of the KBAs, oh, um, Attorney Libiran, did you want to um, ask your question on, on the... Um, uh, key biodiversity areas and ancestral domains and which is a great uh, question yeah yeah that's fine uh, thank you matthew um actually this is more for uh, commissioner rachel but uh you said anna you may you may also answer it, uh, because i think uh, um it's it's relevant uh, especially when we did the the ngp in 2012 uh, so the gef uh, determined that at least 85%, I think, was the figure of all the uh, key biodiversity areas are found in ancestral domains. And uh, that's, that's huge. Right? If, if it's really 85%, I think they did this uh, with, with PAFID. Um, and, uh, but, but I don't see any um, concrete programs in the NDCs that would address that or that would specifically support conservation in, in ancestral domains. I remember in 2012, there was a problem with the NGP because of the FPIC requirement. So DNR itself was questioning why they had to go through FPIC when this is a, uh, a state-sanctioned project. And uh, in relation to that, do we have programs to support community-led conservations also? Perhaps I could respond in terms of the NDC and uh, just to explain that we, we do not go down to the very specifics in the NDC in terms of outlining projects or programs. So the NDC 
of the Philippines mentions biodiversity in uh, in the context of adaptation, and we are committing to undertake adaptation to get our communities ready to be resilient and to help them develop the capacity to adjust to the impacts. Uh, and this includes coastal and marine uh, ecosystems and biodiversity. So that is the phrase that we can find in the NDC. And uh, as to programs where uh, we can uh, in, uh, implement or adhere to the FPIC ancestral domain legal frameworks, I, I honestly, uh, we have not yet discussed that in terms of that will come in the implementation aspect really of the NDC. And if, I, uh, if I'm not mistaken, it will be either the Department of uh, uh, Agriculture or the DNR that will be uh, focal in implementing these uh, programs. Uh, if I may uh, reply. Yeah. Um, Please. I I believe that that portion regarding the ancestral domains in the NDC would come under the adaptation measures that we have proposed. There's one component there regarding protected area development and management. As we know, most of these protected areas overlap with the ancestral domains and the programs involved include uh, um, the delineation of the of the protected areas uh, to ensure that the uh, proper management of the of the, the of the area, uh, capacitating our protected area management board, uh, also um, ensuring resource inventory for proper management, and we also uh, support community livelihoods uh, for coastal areas. We promote uh, biodiversity friendly enterprises. Uh, of course, uh, we have um, we still have. To, for, for 2022, we have actually increased our, our uh, budget for protected area development and management not to really ensure that the communities will be supported in the, in the management of the protected area. So I think these are the specific projects or activities that we can cite under the adaptation measures which form part of the, of the NDC. Um, and can I just sort of do a quick follow up because I, I mean you did mention you know the the important value of um, existing forests as as carbon sinks, and I recall um, you know one of the early pledges that came out of Glasgow was the forest pledge um, in terms of you know ceasing deforestation. Um, and Attorney Donner has has asked a question in the chat box about will the advanced NGP give more power to the FMB to stop land grabbing of forest lands? I'm also uh, interested in, um, I wasn't sure if the, the, I thought the Philippines had actually signed on to the forest declaration. I know it's unraveled a bit uh, since it was first launched only 10 days ago, um, but certainly is forest uh, or deforestation or attempts to uh, stop deforestation, uh, are these things that might, you know, come into play um, in, in some, you know, further action or stronger action in the next um, uh, few weeks and months? Yeah, as we a, as a actually... We also actually committed under adaptation measures, uh, anti-illegal logging and uh, forest protection measures, which will uh, uh, strengthen enforcement of our uh, forestry laws in uh, forest uh, uh, forest areas. And uh, of course, we need to uh, improve the, or that's why it's uh, called the Enhanced uh, National Greening Program. Um, we expanded the species covered, and also we would like to uh, go into more family-based approach, um, and these are some. These are our safeguards to ensure that um, those with uh, appropriate renewal instruments are the ones allowed to uh, to do reforestation activities within the forest uh, forested areas. And we are um, adopting also some innovation and technology to improve our forest monitoring and uh, forest law enforcement. So uh, we hope to um, uh, roll out some of this uh, innovation and technology uh, in the monitoring so that we can uh, address the gaps in our uh, forestry law enforcement. So we hope this can address the issue regarding land grabbing and also ensuring that the remaining forests that we have are, are protected. Uh, until now, we have not lifted the moratorium regarding uh, 
ban on cutting of trees, especially in protection forests. And in terms of the production forests, of course, because these are covered by uh, forestry management agreements, they are allowed but subject to the uh, approval of uh, development plan that they have uh, that they have to submit no, and the compliance also under the environmental impact assessment. Thank you very much. So I, I do note we're, we're at our 10 o'clock um, thing, but I, it's been such a very rich and exciting debate. I would like to you know, give you an opportunity, each of our panelists to, to have a sort of a, a short summation uh, in terms of, you know, I mean, perhaps even the, the future where we are going uh, in the Philippines uh, on, on our focus on national determined contributions, but also on uh, achieving um, uh, sort of a climate resilience as much as as much as possible. Um, who would like to go first, Dean Tony, uh, Commissioner? I can Rachel. go first. Um, yeah. uh, anyone familiar with with my work here knows that uh, I think uh, that this is an era of climate justice at the international and at the national level. Uh, climate justice is between countries. It's between the rich and poor within countries, between companies and individuals and communities within countries and also in the world. Uh, it's between generations and it's between species. Um, lawyers, uh, I encourage lawyers uh, and, and in, in all my classes, I teach quite a lot of classes, uh, both environmental law, both also environmental policy with scientists and oh, the whole range. Uh, exploring all the different ways we can push climate justice at all levels. Um, so in the Philippines, for example, I have a big project now that I'm doing with Client Earth, um, where we're working with law schools. Uh, we're starting first with Ateneo Law Schools in all uh, in Mindanao and in, in, in Manila, so and Naga, uh, are the five Ateneo Law Schools, uh, to flesh out what loss and damage means legally at the local level. How do we document loss and damage uh, visually, um, you know, uh, documentarily, so that we can use it for compensation and liability cases in the Philippines against companies, against the government when they do not implement what they should be implementing, and of course, against carbon majors and, and uh, uh, companies. Very exciting field, actually. Uh, training, you know, we're trying to try to train 100 um, students and lawyers and law professors to, to be able to document uh, uh, loss and damage and then use that at different levels of, of government. So that, that's that kind of thing I think we, we need to do now for climate because we're, we're really way beyond trying to prevent it or, or even adapting. Th those things are still necessary. Uh, I always say the first 10 years was about mitigation. The next 10 years was about adaptation. And now we're on, now at climate justice, but we still have to do adaptation and mitigation all at the same time. And, and I think that's what we do. And it's a role of legal education to, to get um, uh, uh, law students, future lawyers and, and young lawyers and even older lawyers. Like, I, you know, my, my, uh, I hope I don't mind, Amado don't mind saying this. He's the father of environmental law in the Philippines and continue to learn from him. We continue to learn even as we, grow older because the problems have changed, have evolved, and the actors are different. I mean, uh, uh, that's why I said, you know, Apostle versus Victorian was good 1994, but it's not really good anymore today. You know? I mean, uh, in a sense that it's not as useful because it's already in the rules of court. I had the honor of drafting the environmental rules of court, and that's the first thing we do, secure that so we don't have to worry about any changes in jurisprudence. But we, have, we, need, we need new ideas because uh, the old ideas obviously didn't work and that's why we have the crisis still before us. So thank, thank you. Thank you, Dean. Thank you very much, Dean Tony. So Commissioner uh, Rachel, did you want to make a final yes. conclusion? Yes, uh, a, lot of, a lot has been said uh, and thank you for this opportunity. First, I'd like to thank the organizers, uh, Matthew, uh, Commissioner Sorerati, ADB, the IUCN, and the UNEP for this opportunity. And just to say that uh, the COP and all of these discussions on climate change and how we can reach the 1.5, these are all very political uh, actions. These are, this is a political annual negotiation. And so lawyers, you know, lawyers uh, have a lot to contribute in this political discussion, whether it's in your barangay, uh, ensuring that laws are implemented or 
at in your institutions. And especially for students, we have to uh, equip our lawyers uh, before they go out and practice in whichever field they might want uh, to contribute to have this uh, climate lens wherever they will go. If they will be in the private sector, the private sector should be an equal partner of the government in ensuring that we are able to uh, in, uh, uh, implement our climate actions. And finally, uh, we should not be lost because science is guiding the way. There's a lot of science that provides us the evidence of what we should uh, aim for. And all these uh, sciences, including uh, the legal profession, should contribute in a harmonious way for us to be able to achieve these targets. Thank you. Thank you very much. So uh, for the last word, um, Under Secretary, I, I should also just note um, there was a, a thank you message to, to DENR for the support that they gave uh, to ensuring that um, environmental and natural resources law became a compulsory subject. So that was from uh, uh, Professor Benito there. Um, so thank you, thank you DENR, um, which has sort of been the impetus behind um, this professional training program. So. Your, your final words would be great. Okay. Uh, well, the government is uh, very committed to mainstream climate change in our national plans, policies, and programs. We have formulated the cabinet cluster roadmap, and uh, part of it is the implementation of a risk resiliency program. And the challenge really now is how to make our local government units work uh, in synchrony, uh, uh, in synergy with the uh, with the, with the national government, uh, we are developing at least an, among the 24 climate um, vulnerable provinces, their uh, investment portfolio for risk resiliency. So I think that is the main challenge now, how we can support the, the local government units uh, for them to implement uh, local climate action so that we can achieve um, impact on, on the ground and develop really the adaptive capacities of our communities and the uh, ecosystem. So uh, we will work uh, on that together with the other stakeholders. And I also would like to join the, my co-resource uh, persons in uh, thanking the organizers for this uh, opportunity. Salamat po. Salamat. Thank you very much. And I'll just uh, turn back over to Mary uh, for the award of the certificates. Um, but I should also just say, I've just put in the, in the chat box, um, uh, again, a link to um, the, um, the, the YouTube channel with some of um, the Seeds of Justice uh, webcast. Um, and last night, uh, we did a, a short Seeds of Justice webcast on climate justice. Um, and I think, you know, just if I can close by someone who works in, in the ASEAN and Asia Pacific region, um, the important thing I think for us to acknowledge is the Philippines really is one of the leaders uh, in terms of grappling with what, what we call, you know, these these very messy problems, um, the really challenging problems. And it obviously, uh, as Dean Tony said, you know, now this is the third phase of our implementation. We have to look at new techniques, new ways of doing things, and new ways of implementation, and new ways of holding people to account. And I think that's going to be one of the interesting uh, conclusions from the COP26 is because um, there was a lot of disappointment, um, expectations were so high that someone said yesterday that, that it was always going to be a disappointment, but we now look at, at new strategies and these might be strategies run in parallel. Um, they might be litigation strategies, policy strategies, uh, cooperation strategies. These are going to be all the challenges that, that we and the next generations face. Um, can I thank our panelists and can I turn back to Mary for the award of the certificates? Um, Salamat po, thank you. Thank you very much, Matthew, and thank you to our invited resource speakers. So the legal to we will now move on to the awarding of the virtual certificate. So the Legal Education Board awards this virtual certificate to Commissioner Rachel Ann Herrera, Climate Change Commissioner, for sharing her time, her knowledge, and expertise as resource speaker during the Environmental Law Teachers Online Training Program, eight session panel discussion on climate change law, held via Zoom virtual conference and given the 17th day of November in the year of our Lord, 2021 in Manila. Shined by, signed by our chairperson, Anna Marie Melanie B. Trinidad. Also with the same citation, the Legal Education Board awards this Certificate of Appreciation to Attorney Antonio G.M. Lavinia, that 
the former dean of Ateneo School of Government at Ateneo de Manila University for sharing his time, knowledge, and expertise as resource speaker during the eight session panel discussion on climate change law of the Environmental Law Teachers Online Training Program given the 17th day of November in the year for 2021 and signed by a chairperson of the Legal Education Board, Ana Marie Melanie B. Trinidad. Lastly, the Legal Education Board also awards the Certificate of Appreciation to, uh, to Attorney Annalisa Revalta Te, the Undersecretary of Finance, Information System, and Climate Change of the Department of Environmental and Natural Resources, for sharing also her time, knowledge, and expertise as resource speaker during the Environmental Law Teachers Online Training Program 8 session panel discussion on climate change law held via Zoom virtual conference and given on the 17th day of November in the year of our Lord 20. 2021. Signed by the chairperson of the Legal Education Board, Ana Marie Melanie B. Trinidad. Thank you very much to our invited resource speakers as well as to our participants for their continued support in the training program. So before we end today's session, we would like to remind our participants to please don't forget to register for your attendance and the completion of the evaluation form, which will be sent to your email after today's session. We will also send to you your the e the link to the next session on November 24. So please check your inbox and spam messages. Again, we remind everyone that we will only now be requiring at least eight session for the issuance of the training certificate. So we, I think we have spilled over our time. So we will now have our lunch break and thank you very much for attending the eighth session of the Environmental Law Training Program. I hope you enjoyed today's session. Again, congratulations to our participants and to our invited resource speakers. Thank you very much for giving us your time.